Chapter 5 Clara woke with a start the following morning. The lantern was still burning beside the bed as she realized she was lying close to her husband with her legs tangled with his. She quickly rolled away from him, not wanting to meet his eyes. She couldn't believe how she'd acted the night before, teasing him as she had. He was her husband and should have been the aggressor in their lovemaking, not her. She quickly pulled the nightgown she'd hid in his room over her head and rushed up the stairs to dress for the day. She washed herself quickly in the cold water from the pitcher in Natalie's room before changing into a clean dress and apron. She fashioned a bun on her head and rushed down the stairs to start breakfast before anyone woke. Albert was just coming out of his room when she reached the bottom of the stairs and she found she couldn't meet his eyes. Good morning, she mumbled as she hurried to the stove to start the fire. He watched her scurry to the stove and wondered what her problem was. He thought their night had gone better than he could have hoped and had really expected most of the nervousness between them to be over. He pulled on his coat and headed to the barn to milk the cow and gather eggs, still contemplating what was going on with his new wife. Did she regret coming to my bed last night? Did I hurt her? I know I did at first, but I thought she found her pleasure. Maybe I scared her somehow. He hurried through his chores, so he could run into the house and talk to her about the night they'd had. He wanted to be able to speak to her before the children came down. When he got back into the house, he saw that Clarence was sitting at the table, dressed for work, and Natalie was at the stove, helping her mother cook. Natalie took him a cup of coffee while Clara quickly fried up the potatoes that were left from supper the night before. He loved that his new wife never wasted a thing. She worked hard to be sure they used all of their resources to the best of her ability. Just the other night, he'd watched her and the girls cutting up some of the old woolen dresses they wore. When he'd questioned it, Clara had explained they would braid the strips they'd cut into rugs so they wouldn't have to stand on the cold floor during the winter. Clara liked to be barefoot, and she would put one in front of the work table so she could work barefoot all through the year. He took the pail of milk and basket of eggs he carried to the work table, leaning down to kiss her cheek as he set the things down. You all right this morning? he asked softly. She nodded without meeting his eyes. She put the potatoes she'd chopped into the frying pan and broke several eggs into it as well. Breakfast is just about ready. Sit down and drink your coffee. He eyed her for a moment before walking to the table and the coffee Natalie had set at his place for him. He took a deep sip and sighed. He wanted to talk to her but knew that wouldn't be possible until the children were in bed. All through breakfast, he kept watching her wondering what he'd done wrong. He certainly hadn't forced her into intimacy. Clara felt his eyes on her through breakfast, and she felt as if she were the worst person alive. How could she have been so forward? Husband or not, he was the man, and he should have been the one to initiate things between them. She didn't know if he'd want her to sleep with him again, or if he'd send her back upstairs to stay with Natalie. She ate her breakfast slowly, hoping he would leave with Clarence and not try to talk to her at all. She really didn't think she could face him. Finally, he stood, thanked her for breakfast, and set his hat on his head. We need to move the cattle today, Clarence. You remember how I showed you to use your rope, he asked. He couldn't waste more time in the house waiting for her to talk to him. He had to get some work done. Clara watched the two of them leave the house, thankful again for how good he was with Clarence. She loved that he was teaching his son the skills that Clarence wanted to learn. She spent the day as she spent every day, but she worried more than usual. By the time he came in at the end of the day, she decided she wouldn't wait for him to send her up to sleep with Natalie. She'd just do it herself. She'd go downstairs and talk to him as if nothing had happened after the children were in bed, and when it was bedtime, she'd simply climb the stairs and sleep with her daughter like she always did. She wished she felt like she could talk to Albert about her concerns, but he had made it clear that he didn't enjoy talking about things like that, 
and she wasn't going to press him. After she'd tucked the children in, she climbed down the stairs and saw him sitting at the table whittling, as he did every night. Would you like another piece of pie? she asked. He looked up, his eyes meeting hers. That would be nice. He watched her as she moved to the stove and uncovered the blackberry pie she'd made for him. It was the best pie you've made. He wished he had the right words that would make her stop being so prickly. Thank you. She cut two generous pieces and poured two glasses of milk, returning to the table to sit with him while they ate the treat. He took a bite and sighed happily. I've never met a woman who could bake quite as well as you do. He was almost ashamed to say it, though, because he had loved his first wife, despite her lack of cooking and baking skills. She smiled, her eyes meeting his for the first time all day. I bet you say that to all the ladies. He laughed softly. I don't think I've ever said it to anyone before. He looked down at his pie, wondering how to phrase his question. Finally, he decided he'd just say it. What did I do wrong last night? She looked at him in surprise. Wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. Why would you ask that? She was shocked he would even bring up their night together. He shrugged. Well, I thought everything was fine between us, but when we got up, you weren't really speaking to me. What was he supposed to think about that? She sighed, staring down at her pie and flicking at the crust with her fork. I just feel like I shouldn't have pushed you into intimacy. That's the man's place, not the woman's. He blinked in surprise. If you hadn't pushed me, we'd have waited a lot longer to be comfortable with each other. I think you were right. The way we were together was unnatural. But I still shouldn't have done it, and I'm sorry. He shook his head. You should have done it. You did the right thing for both of us. Albert stood and took his empty pie plate to the basin for her to wash with the breakfast dishes, going back to the table and removing her empty plate to set next to his. But if it makes you feel better, tonight I'll be the one to start things off. He took her hand and pulled her into the bedroom, shutting the door with a snap behind them. He pulled her into his arms and kissed her soundly. As soon as her mouth was free, she looked up at him. You really don't mind? Mind? I can't think of a man alive who would mind. I enjoy making love with my wife. She smiled, her head resting against his shoulder. Then I guess we're all right? He laughed softly. We're more than all right. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. They found an easy routine after that. Their first real challenge was the first blizzard to roll through. As soon as Albert realized how bad it was, he strung some rope from the house to the barn so he could go back and forth easily to milk the cow and collect the eggs. They'd known a storm like this was bound to come, but she'd been surprised to see the first so early in the year. It was only early November. She was pleased that he wouldn't allow Clarence to go out to the barn with him in the bitter cold. Clara had planned on washing clothes the morning of the blizzard, so she simply strung a line up in the cellar and dried the clothes down there, keeping to her routine as much as possible. Natalie, Clarence, and Gertie sat at the table working on their schoolwork, while Clara mended clothes. Robert played quietly as he did every day while the older children completed their studies. Albert was the problem. He paced the room. Back and forth. Back and forth. He couldn't be still. Are you all right? Clara asked when she got too dizzy to let him continue. He nodded once and resumed pacing. Clara tried again. Do you want me to get your whittling for you? He shook his head, continuing to pace. She assumed it was just that he didn't enjoy being stuck indoors, so she kept up her work and tried not to notice his pacing. After the children were in bed and all the work for the day was finished, he finally explained. Every time we have a blizzard, we lose cattle. I always worry we'll lose too much of the herd to keep going. 
Clara's eyes widened with understanding. When will we know how they fared? When the blizzard is over. Hopefully this one will just last a day. Sometimes they're four or five. They'd had blizzards in Massachusetts, of course, but they hadn't had cattle to worry about. Farmers weren't affected as much by the blizzards as the ranchers. She tried not to worry. Finally, after the third day, the winds died down, and he and Clarence left to assess the damage. They only lost a few head. He was relieved as he told her of their losses in bed that night. I've lost as many as a hundred head in these storms. We were lucky this time. Only five were lost. They were thankful there weren't more lost during the storm. I'm so glad. Five isn't good, but it could have been so much worse. I know. He hugged her close. For Christmas I'd like to have a turkey. Do you think you could get one? I want to make stuffing and mashed potatoes and gravy. I know my kids love that. Albert nodded in the darkness. I can do that. You have big plans for Christmas? Sally had always made a big production at Christmas time, and he loved the idea of continuing that for the children. I'd like our first Christmas together to be special. I've made special gifts for all the children. I still need to finish Clarence's, but the others are done. And what would you like for Christmas? he asked. Oh, I don't need a gift. I have everything I could possibly need. So you're going to rob the children of the joy of giving you a gift, he asked in mock surprise. I just don't need anything. He sighed. We'll think of something. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The only thing that kept Clara from being completely happy during the first months of her marriage was not understanding her husband. He would be kind and considerate at times, but he was sullen and withdrawn at others. She could never understand what would happen to turn him moody. One evening in mid-December, while they were eating supper, he announced he had to go into town the following day. She'd written two letters, one for her parents and one for Elizabeth Miller, to let them know she was faring well. She wrote to Elizabeth because she wanted to, but to her parents, because she felt obligated. Would you post some letters for me while you're in town? she asked. She really wanted to go with him. Would he be angry if she asked? He gave a curt nod. Have them ready in the morning. I've already written them. I was just waiting for you to go to town to mail them. She looked at the children. Would it be all right if we all went with you? She clenched her hands together in her lap, hoping he'd agree. He looked at her in surprise. Well, I don't know about that. It will be very cold. She shrugged. We have coats, and we'll cover up with quilts. We can take some hot potatoes for our lunch, and they'll keep our feet warm. If Albert and Clarence could handle the cold, then she and the others could too. He studied her for a moment before finally saying, I suppose that's fine. Make sure the children are dressed for it, though. I don't want any complaints about how cold it is. I won't complain, she said with a smile. She looked around at the children. Will you complain if it's too cold on our way to town tomorrow? They all shook their heads. We want to go. Gertie said, in a way that told Clara that a trip to town was a big treat for his children. Back in Massachusetts, her children had walked to town every day to go to school, so it was a bit odd to her that his children went to town so rarely. The next morning dawned with a bitter wind, but she was determined to take the children. She put long underwear on all of them, and then put their regular clothes over the top. They all wore coats as well. She took every quilt in the house in an effort to keep them warm. She'd gotten up well before dawn so she could bake some potatoes for their lunches, which they would also use to keep their feet warm. After breakfast Albert turned to her with a look of worry. Are you sure it's not too cold for the children? Clara nodded. The children will be fine. 
The sleigh had two seats, and the three older children sat in the back together while Robert squeezed between Albert and Clara on the front. The ride to Billings was very cold, and they all huddled together, but the potatoes kept their feet warm, and Clara was happy to get out of the house for a while. She wanted to try to find just the right knife for his whittling. It was his only hobby, and she wanted him to have something special to do his carvings with. She still had a bit of money from the sales of her household goods in Massachusetts, so she could afford one. Of course, they also needed more flannels and more yarn so she could continue making clothes that would keep them warm through the winter. She had even begun working on a new quilt for Robert with all of their old ragged clothing they no longer would wear. It was really too cold to talk much, so they sat huddled together under the blanket that covered them. When they reached town, he helped her down from the sleigh while the children found their way down. They all went into the mercantile to look for different things. It was the first time Clara had been to the store in Billings, so she wandered around for a moment to figure out where everything was. She went to the fabric table and saw that the knives were directly next to the bolts of cloth. She fingered some of the materials while she looked over at the knife display. There was one that had a man on a horse with a cowboy hat and a lariat, and she smiled. That was the one she wanted. She chose six different colors of flannel for new underclothes for everyone as well as new nightgowns and dresses. She quickly chose some yarns and some dried goods, but there wasn't much they needed in the way of food. Her husband had obviously planned on being snowed in for the winter and chosen accordingly. She took her purchases to the front and explained that Albert would be paying but said she wanted the knife for him for a Christmas gift. She wanted that wrapped and given to her alone. She got the amount and gave him the money she had in her pocket. Thank you for your help, she whispered. She went over to the pot display and looked at what they had. There were a couple of huge pots that she would love to have to cook with, but she wasn't going to ask for anything for herself. As long as he was seen to and the children had whatever they needed, she was content. While she was looking, she overheard a conversation. Look at her standing there acting as if she has a right to spend his money when he paid for her to come out here and marry him. It was a low feminine voice, and Clara bristled at its tone. Another voice reached her. I can't believe someone would actually become a mail-order bride. You'd have to feel like you were bought and paid for. It must be like being a slave. Clara felt tears pop into her eyes and walked across the store to a small display of pocket watches. She wasn't going to let the women hurt her feelings. She'd put up with a lot of snide remarks back in Beckham when she didn't immediately remarry and instead tried to make a go of farming. She could handle this. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Albert looked at the display of brooches on the table in front of him. He knew that Clara had sold her favorite cameo brooch before leaving Beckham so she wouldn't come to him with her children in worn clothes. She hadn't told him, but Clarence had told him a lot while they'd worked together. He was glad he had the older boy to divulge things to him. As he looked over the display, a couple of local ranchers came up beside him. You sure do have all the luck, Hanson. Albert looked at the other man, Frank wondering what he was talking about. Why? You had the prettiest wife in town, and when she died, you send off for a mail-order bride. You could have gotten some ugly thing with a terrible personality, and instead, you end up with a pretty little bride who actually seems to enjoy being here. How do you do it? Albert knew the other man was referring to how many of the local ranchers' wives seemed to go crazy during the long winters. He shrugged. You're right. I'm lucky. He didn't talk about the anguish he'd felt when Sally died. These men were idiots, and he would never share anything personal with them. The second man, John, shook his head. Maybe I'll send off for a mail order bride too. If I can get one as pretty as yours, I'll start looking forward to going to bed at night. Albert wasn't going to listen any longer. Do you two actually need something? 
The first man shrugged. Nothing more than a little bit of your luck. Albert chose the brooch that he thought looked as much as possible like the one Clarence had described. He picked it up and kept his hand clenched around it while going toward the front. The second man followed along with him. I guess that means you care for the pretty new wife. Sure, got over the other fast, didn't you? Albert said nothing as he paid for the purchases that had been stacked on the long counter for them. He knew that Clara had added some things, and he told Clarence to pick something out for Clara from him. Samuel, the merchant, put everything into wooden crates for him. Nice new wife you have there, Albert. Glad to see you're not always having to come to town for bread any longer. Albert nodded before making his first trip out to the sleigh with their purchases. He put it on the floor at the back of the sleigh, knowing the children would be able to deal with less leg room better than he and Clara could. Clarence showed up right behind him with a crate to put in as well. The look on his face gave Albert pause. What's wrong, Clarence? Albert had never seen the boy anything but jovial. Had someone said something to him as well? Clarence shrugged. Nothing. I know something's wrong. Tell me what it is. A man in the store asked me if you were my pa. I didn't know how to answer that. Albert smiled, happy it was something so simple. He put his arm around the boy's shoulders and led him back into the store to get the girls and little Robert, who he'd set Natalie to minding. Clara didn't get to shop enough, and he knew women liked to buy new things. I'm your pa. As soon as your ma married me, I became your pa. I don't care what other people say or think. Clarence's eyes brightened. Can I start to call you pa then? Albert nodded. It was only then that he realized the boy had never called him pa, but he didn't call him Albert either. He was always just called sir. He should have realized there was a problem months ago. I'd be honored if you called me pa. After they'd carried the last of their purchases to the sleigh, Albert went back inside to get Clara. Time to go. As soon as he looked at her, he couldn't help but think about what the ranchers in the store had said. Had he really replaced Sally too quickly? Yes, his children needed good food, but he could have managed a bit longer. Couldn't he? He helped Clara and Robert into the sleigh before climbing up beside Robert. Do you want to eat before we leave or stop on the way? Clara was fighting back the tears from what the women had said. She'd needed to be strong in their presence, but now she needed to be alone so she could cry for a moment. She didn't want to show weakness before her husband or children. I'd like to get out of town first. Even go all the way home. It's not that late. Albert looked at her for a moment before clicking to the horses. She was upset, just as he was. They needed to stay out of town and away from people who would upset them. He drove straight to the house. While he and Clarence unloaded the sleigh, Clara started a fire while the girls got Robert out of his winter gear and set the table. She took the now cold potatoes and put them in the oven for a few minutes to warm them while she set out butter to go with them. She poured milk for the children and heated up the coffee from the morning for herself and Albert. While they ate, Albert kept looking at her as if he were just realizing she didn't belong in his house. Clara could barely control the tears. She knew she needed to wait until the girls were doing the dishes to cry, but she wasn't certain she could hold out that long. She couldn't let the children see her cry. Albert watched Clara while they ate, wondering what had been said to hurt her so much at the store. Why couldn't people just accept that they'd done what they needed to do and let two lonely people find happiness together? Clara escaped to her room soon after lunch. Albert and Clarence had gone on to the range to take more hay to the cows, Robert was napping, and the girls were washing dishes. She lay down on the bed for a moment and cried her eyes out. She knew she wasn't as pretty as his first wife. She knew that every time she spotted the other woman's photograph, which was still on the dresser. 
She was doing her best to be a good wife and mother, though. Did that count for nothing? She took ten minutes wallowing in her anguish, and then realized there was nothing she could do but work harder and try to please him more. She knew he enjoyed their time alone together while the children were in bed at night. That was something. Eventually, maybe he'd have some affection for her. Right now, affection seemed to be too much to ask. She hurried into the main room, still feeling chilled from her time in the sleigh. She made a thick stew for supper filled with carrots and potatoes and some of their own beef. By the time Albert got into the house, she was in a surly mood, angered that he hadn't known anything was wrong. The table was set and they were ready to eat. Everyone ate in silence, her anger filling the air, and he seemed to be angry as well. She had no idea what was wrong with him, though. What did he have to be angry about? She did everything for him and his children. After tucking the children into bed, she walked down the stairs, thinking she'd just get her nightgown and sleep upstairs, with Natalie. She didn't have much of a desire to be around her husband. She certainly had no desire to sleep beside him through the night. When he saw her go into their bedroom, he stood and followed. What are you doing? Getting my nightgown. I'm going to sleep in Natalie's room with her tonight. What is your problem? When we left town, you seemed upset and now you seem angry enough to hurt someone. Why? The look on his face told her he didn't want to put up with her mood. She brushed past him without answering. He grabbed her arm. What have I done to make you so angry? She spun on him, wanting to lash out at him for everything that had been said about her in town. Everything that had ever been said about her or her children. For every time she felt inadequate. She knew she was being unfair, though, and tears sprang to her eyes again. Nothing. You're angry with me for no reason then? She nodded, walking up to him and burying her face against his chest, relieved when his arms folded around her. I can't explain it. I'm never this emotional. He held her close, rocking her in his arms. It's a hard life here. She nodded, knowing that wasn't it either. She would love her life there if she wasn't so unsure of him. I just wish I didn't always feel so inferior. He pulled away from her, staring at her in shock. Inferior? You really feel inferior? Why? She shrugged. I feel like I don't cook well enough. Like I don't sew well enough. I'm not a good enough mother. Your children deserve their real mother, who did things the way she did them. They shouldn't have to put up with me. He shook his head in disbelief. You are a wonderful cook. There's never anything left when you cook. How could you not think that you're good enough? He sighed. Robert barely remembers his mother at all. She was sick for most of his life, and the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. Even when she was well, she wasn't the kind of cook and mother you are. You have everything perfect around the house all the time. She never did. Clara stared at him. I never have anything perfect. I have two girls who work beside me all day to make the house as presentable as it is. I guess we all see our own shortcomings. I don't see you as having any. I think you're a fabulous wife and mother. She bit her lip against the words she truly wanted to say. She wanted to ask why he didn't love her if she was a good wife and mother, but she knew that was completely inappropriate. He was still mourning Sally. She walked to the dresser and put her nightgown on top of it, knowing she'd wear it that night. Walking back into the main room, she got her crochet hook and yarn and sat at the table. Tell me about Sally. How did you meet her? He sat down with his whittling, a new block of wood in his hands. We were neighbors growing up. We both lived in a small Texas town. It was my dream to be a rancher, so I saved up every dime I could, and remained living at home with my parents until I had enough to buy a small piece of land and some cattle. My father was the barber in our town, 
and I was an only child. He carefully made a long slice through the wood. Sally waited for me. She was five years younger than me, but I was thirty before I felt like I was ready to marry and start our lives together. We married on her twenty-fifth birthday. Clara was startled a woman would wait for a man so long. That never happened in the East that she'd seen. Did you move up here right away? He nodded. We got married and started our journey the next day. We got our land here, and our cattle, and began our lives together. She was happy here for the first few years. We had Gertie three years after we married and then Robert. She was so sickly after Robert was born. I kept begging her to go to the doctor in town, but she kept saying that it was just that she needed time to recover from childbirth. By the time we got her to the doctor, he said it was too late. If I'd taken her sooner, he might have been able to do something, but I didn't. Clara squeezed his hand. You can't blame yourself for her death. I can't not blame myself for her death. She was a good woman, and I loved her, and I let her die. He shook his head, his eyes dark and sad. How did your husband die? He had a heart attack while working one day. Finances had been tight, and the doctor said he just worried himself to death. And you tried to farm after his death? She nodded. I couldn't see remarrying so quickly, although I had a couple of offers. When the bank told me they were foreclosing, I felt like I had to get out of town. I had to figure out a way to raise my children without the constant worry that I was feeling. And you answered my letter. I'm glad you did. You are? She was truly astonished by that fact. She thought he resented her. He nodded. You're a good wife to me and a good mother for my children. How could I not be glad it was you who came to marry me? She was pleased by his statement, but not sure if she really believed him. He'd obviously truly loved his wife. She would always be second best. Chapter 6 It was late the following afternoon, when she'd just sat down after baking six fresh loaves of bread and a cake, and had dinner in the oven staying warm for when Albert and Clarence got back that she heard a knock on the door. In the months she'd been there, they'd never had a visitor. Clara jumped to her feet and rushed to the door. She blinked twice at the woman in front of her. She was a carbon copy of Sally. She knew because she'd looked at the other woman's photo enough, hoping she could be more like her. May I help you? she asked softly. I'm Mary. My brother-in-law lives here. At least I think he does. Is this Albert Hansen's house? Mary acted as if she had every right in the world to be there, and Clara had no thought of turning her away. Clara nodded. Yes, of course it is. Come in. Mary waved to the driver of the sleigh, and he drove off. It was only then that she realized Mary had a carpet bag. Thank goodness. I thought I was lost. The pretty woman in front of her had blonde hair and green eyes. Her cheeks were rosy from the cold. She picked up her bag and hurried into the house, warming herself in front of the fire. My husband died last month, so I came here to keep house for Albert. Where is my brother-in-law anyway? Clara was stunned to hear the question. Did she not know Albert at all? It's the middle of the day. He's out on the range working. Mary nodded. Okay. Well, where's my room? Clara studied the older woman, trying to figure out what to do with her. Well, we really don't have any empty rooms. Her gaze settled on the girl sitting at the table, doing their schoolwork. Would you two be willing to share so Aunt Mary can have a room to herself? Natalie and Gertie exchanged looks. Yes, ma'am, they said in unison. Clara smiled, happy that was resolved. Okay, girls, run upstairs and move all Gertie's things into Natalie's room. She looked at Mary. I'll change the sheets in Gertie's room when they're done. She walked to the stove and started the coffee pot. Are you hungry? 
I made a cake that's still cooling. She'd planned to serve it for supper, but she could whip up a pie while she waited for the coffee to heat up. Mary shook her head. Oh, no. I don't eat cake. I'm watching my figure. Clara smiled, looking at how slender Mary was. What was she going to do with her? I understand. She sat at the table. Have a seat. I'm Clara, by the way. Albert and I married in September. Oh. I had no idea Albert had already remarried. Mary frowned. I guess he doesn't need a housekeeper, after all. The look on her face told Clara she was very upset that Albert had married without first discussing things with her. You can stay with us for a while. We have plenty of room. Clara hoped the other woman would be gone as soon as possible though. She didn't want to have to feel like she was in the shadow of her husband's late wife for the rest of her life. She already felt that way a great deal of the time. Having someone who looked just like her in her home would only make things worse. Oh, wonderful. I'll help however, I can around the house. I can see you're having a hard time of it. She walked to a windowsill and wiped her finger along it as if to say Clara's home wasn't clean enough. Clara bristled. Everything in her home was kept just the way she wanted it to be, and she spent hours scrubbing every day. That will be nice. I'm sure there are some special dishes you know how to make that you could teach me. She'd be as polite as she could be during the other woman's time there. Maybe Albert knew of a single man they could marry her off to. Quickly. I'm sure I do. Albert loved my sister's cooking. I could teach you to make everything she used to make for him. Clara smiled, knowing the other woman wouldn't realize how strained the smile was. Thank you. I'd like that. Robert came down the stairs then, rubbing his eyes from sleep. He looked at Mary for a moment, before hurrying into Clara's arms. He was obviously nervous around the stranger. How long has it been since you've seen the children? Clara asked as she held Robert in her lap. Oh, I've never seen the children. I haven't seen Albert since the day he married my sister. Mary walked over to sit across from Clara. I'm your Aunt Mary, she said to Robert, trying to take him from Clara's arms. Robert looked at her out of the corner of his eye, obviously wanting to stay where he was. He's shy when he first wakes up, Clara explained quickly. She didn't know if that was true or not, but she didn't want the other woman's feelings to be hurt that he wouldn't go to her. Nonsense. He wants to be held by his Auntie Mary, don't you, boy? Boy? Didn't she know his name? Robert, Aunt Mary would like to hold you. Robert shook his head and buried his face in the crook of Clara's neck. I want you, Mama. Clara shrugged. I'm not going to force him. Why not? You're spoiling my nephew. Sally would hate that. Sally's not here to hate it. Clara cuddled the boy close, knowing he was upset by the argument going on around him. What was wrong with Mary to upset her nephew this way? She hoped that Albert told the woman to leave. She didn't think he would, but she could always hope. Clara pulled dinner out of the oven and set it on the table. She made gravy with the drippings in the bottom of the roast pan and then set the table. The girls were still moving rooms, so she couldn't ask them. She was surprised that Mary, with all her talk to being a housekeeper for the family, didn't get up and do it, but she seemed content to watch Clara work. Albert stepped into the house, stomping on the rug just inside the door, taking off his coat and hanging his hat on the peg by the door. He moved out of the way while Clarence did the same. He walked straight to Clara and leaned down to kiss her. Dinner smells wonderful. Clara smiled up at him, pleased the first thing he did with Mary there was show her affection. We have a guest, she said, using her thumb to indicate the table. Robert usually sat at the table while she finished preparing a meal, but instead, he was clinging to her skirts. 
Albert reached down to lift his son into his arms before turning to the table. He did a double take. Mary, he asked, his voice obviously shocked. He didn't move over to her, but instead stood with Robert right beside Clara. What are you doing here? Mary walked across the room and pulled Albert down into a hug, squeezing Robert in the process. My husband died, so I had to decide what to do. I thought with Sally gone, you could use a housekeeper. She looked at Clara with a disgusted look. Looks like you've already replaced her though. Clara froze with surprise. Did Mary really just say that to Albert? What is wrong with that woman? Albert's voice was stiff. I found a new wife. When Sally was dying, she told me that she didn't want me to spend the rest of my life alone. His gaze met his sister-in-law's evenly. You could have waited a respectable amount of time. I'm through discussing this, Mary. Why are you here, and how long will you stay? I came to help you. I already told you that. I don't know how long I'll stay. I actually hoped that things might work out between us. You can stay as long as you're not a burden. You'll help Clara with chores and do your part. As soon as you stop, I'll put you on a train straight back to Texas. Robert obviously felt no love for the woman, despite her resemblance to his first wife. Clara breathed a sigh of relief. Maybe she wouldn't stay for long after all. What would I do in Texas? Mama and Papa are gone. Albert shrugged. I'm sorry about the death of your family. I have some friends in the area who are looking for a wife. Albert thought of the two men from the mercantile the day before. He'd love to see one of them marry his sister-in-law. All they cared about was getting a pretty wife. Mary was pretty all right. You wouldn't mind seeing me married to one of your friends? He shrugged. Honestly, I don't care what you do as long as you don't cause problems in my house. He walked to the table and sat down, still holding Robert. What did you do today? He asked the boy. Robert shrugged. I had breakfast and lunch, and I practiced writing my letters and counted a lot. Mama made me take a nap again. He made a face. Albert smiled, hugging the boy close. Mama was right to make you nap. You have to nap every day if you want to grow up to be a big strong cowboy. And eat all my supper. Yes, you need to eat all your supper. Albert saw Clara was pouring the gravy into a bowl. Let's wash our hands so we can eat. Clarence was still standing in the doorway, holding his hat in his hands. He was obviously uncomfortable about the situation. Albert noticed him standing there and he smiled. Wash your hands, boy. Your mama has supper almost ready. Clarence nodded. Yes, sir. He rushed to the basin and washed his hands as soon as Albert and Robert were through. He took his normal seat at the table, even though it was beside the stranger. Mary smiled at him. I'm your new aunt, Mary. Hello. He said nothing else. Clara put the dishes on the table. Clarence? Would you run upstairs and tell your sisters that it's supper time and they can come down? They can finish their task after supper. Albert leaned against the sink, looking at Clara. What do you have them doing? he asked. They're moving all of Gertie's things into Natalie's room. Natalie's room is bigger, and the girls can share it, while Mary takes Gertie's room. Albert shook his head, not liking the situation. Mary had once pulled the wool over his eyes, and he wasn't her biggest fan, but he couldn't see tossing her out on her bottom like he wanted to do. He had loved his wife too much to treat her sister that way. That's fine. He put Robert into the seat beside him, knowing that the young boy didn't want anything to do with his aunt. He took his place at the head of the table and figured everyone else could take care of themselves. Clara put all the dishes of food onto the table and then took her seat at the foot. The children came barreling down the stairs a moment later, 
and they all looked at the stranger. I didn't think. There's an extra chair in our room. Clara stood to get the chair. Excuse me. Albert shook his head. I'll get the chair. You start serving the children. Robert usually sat beside Clara so she could fix his plate easier. With him down on the other end of the table, it would be harder. She stood and walked down to him, fixing his plate. Do you want more carrots? she asked. Robert nodded. I love carrots. And they're good for you. I'm glad you like them. She finished fixing his plate and hurried back to her place just as Albert came back with the chair. He placed it beside Clara at the table and Natalie slipped into the seat because Mary was in her normal place. After Albert prayed while they passed the food around, Clara told the children, This is Aunt Mary. She's going to be staying here for a while. She pointed to each of the children as she said their names. That's Robert, Gertie, and Natalie, and Clarence is sitting next to you. Mary smiled sweetly. I'm sure we're all going to get along just great. All of the children watched her warily while they ate, and there was no real conversation. Did you girls get most of Gertie's things moved? Clara asked. Natalie nodded. We had just finished when Clarence came up to get us. Oh, good. I'll go up and change the linens on Gertie's bed while you girls do the dishes, Clara said. Albert shook his head. If Mary's going to be staying here, then she needs to do it herself. She can't expect you to wait on her, Clara. Clara sighed. I was just thinking it would be okay for tonight, because she obviously traveled a long way. I am very weary from my travels, Mary interjected. Mary needs to do it herself, Albert repeated. When Clara first arrived, she'd been on a train with two children for a full week, and she came home and started cleaning and cooked supper without a single complaint. I expect you to do your share. He said nothing else until Mary said, I'll do it, Albert. As soon as supper was over, Mary disappeared upstairs with her carpet bag and the sheets Clara gave her. Clara sat down beside Albert while Clarence started to work on his schoolwork. I'm sorry if I shouldn't have invited her to stay, Clara said. Albert shook his head. No, I won't turn her out. He sighed heavily. Mary was Sally's twin. I courted her, and she ran off to marry someone else, because I wasn't ready to settle down yet. She had no children. I married Sally, because as soon as Mary left, I realized she was the one I'd loved all along. He pulled Robert into his lap again. I guess Mary decided that since both of our spouses were deceased, we should get married. I never encouraged her to think that. I don't really want her here. Clara bit her lip. But you courted her once, and she looks exactly like your first wife. Don't you wish you'd waited to marry her? Albert shook his head. No, I really don't. Nothing else was said about the matter, because Mary came back down the stairs. Clara hurried over to get the dress she was hemming for Gertie and spread it out on her lap. Her fingers picked up her sewing where she'd left it off the night before. Each of the girls would have new dresses for Christmas, and the boys would have new suits. She'd been working hard on them and wanted them to wear them to Christmas morning services. They weren't able to go to church often because of how far out they lived, but she really wanted to attend service on Christmas, and Albert had agreed. Albert picked up his whittling, and the girls finished the dishes before settling down with their crocheting. Both girls were trying to make some fine lace for pillowcases for their hope chests. Mary plopped down in a chair with nothing in her hands and once again tried to entice Robert to come to her. Instead, he sat at the floor at Clara's feet, playing with a small wooden train his father had made for him. Robert, I look just like your mama did. Come play with me. Albert looked at Mary. We use the time after supper to work quietly because Clarence is doing his schoolwork. He's out on the range with me all day and needs to keep up his book learning. 
Mary sighed heavily, but didn't say anything else. Instead, she leaned back in her chair and looked around the room. After a moment, Clara asked, Would you like to use some yarn and my crochet hook? My knitting needles? You're welcome to work on something quietly yourself. She couldn't imagine how it would be to sit completely idle with nothing to do. Mary shook her head. Oh, I don't do those things. She sighed. I prefer to talk to the people around me and get to know them. We have plenty of time for that during the day after the girls finish their schoolwork, Clara said with a smile, bending back to her task. They worked silently for two hours with Mary just looking around her. By the time they were finished, Clara was ready to kick the other woman. She didn't want her girls to think that idleness was okay. Finally, Clara stood, the dress hemmed. We'll try that on you in the morning, Gertie. I think it's going to look beautiful. Gertie smiled. Thanks, Mama. I can't wait. Time for bed, everyone. Clara watched as Clarence closed his book and returned all of his school books to their place on the bookshelf in the corner of the room. Both girls gathered up their crocheting and put them into the work basket Clara kept. Robert stood and started climbing the stairs. Clara followed closely behind Robert, hoping that Mary would take the hint and go to bed as well. She didn't want the other woman there during her quiet time with her husband. She met with the children in the boys' room as always. She told them one bedtime story and tucked each of them into bed. Natalie had always joked that she was too old to be tucked, but Clara found the girl still loved the individual time it got her with her mother. Once all the lights were off upstairs, Clara started down the stairs, knowing Mary had stayed down with Albert. I can't believe you married her. She couldn't look less like Sally. What were you thinking? I marry who I want to marry, and you have no say over anything I do. You gave up those rights. I'm glad you're finally meeting the children after all these years, but I'm not going to put up with you not helping out around the house. You will be productive or you will get out. My wife has enough on her with four young ones to feed and clothe. She doesn't need you to add to her work. Four hands are better than two, Albert. You'll be shocked at how much more gets done with both of us here. Clara stepped into the room from the stairs and went over to take down her knitting. She'd finished the Christmas gifts for everyone, but they all still needed some new socks and that was her next task. She badly wanted to do the best thing for her children. I think it's so quaint how you use all of your free time to make things for the children, Tara. That's really nice of you. Clara didn't correct the other woman's pronunciation of her name because she knew she'd done it deliberately. I enjoy doing things for my family. Albert smiled at her, his knife slicing through the wood quickly and efficiently. He'd made more train cars for Robert's train and some small woodland creatures for Gertie. He hadn't known what to do for Natalie, so she'd suggested he make her a small bed to put her dolls on. She no longer played with dolls, but she liked to have them sitting out nicely. He'd made Clarence a toolbox and would slowly fill it with tools of his own. Clarence was proving to be a huge help around the house. What are you making tonight? Clara asked Albert as she eyed the piece of wood. Albert smiled. I want to do just a couple more animals for Gertie's collection. She loves animals so much. I think this one will be a bunny. Clara smiled. She'll love it. Mary looked at them both. So I guess it's okay to talk now that the children are in bed? Clara nodded. The only reason it wasn't before is Clarence really does need to study in the evenings. He spends every day helping Albert work, and I don't want him falling behind in his studies. Mary looked at Albert. It's nice of you to teach a boy who isn't even yours how to do hard work like that. I'm sure he slows you down a lot. Albert shook his head. Clarence doesn't slow me down at all. He's a huge help to me. This is the first winter that I've felt like I had a good handle on all the work. 
It's really nice of you to say that. I guess I never realized what a very nice man you are, Albert. Clara watched the byplay between the two, disgusted. What was Mary trying to do? I honestly enjoy it. Clarence really does help. We're having to feed the cattle on the open range. I can slowly drive the sleigh through the field, and Clarence stands on the back, pitching hay to the animals. Before, I'd have to jump down and do it myself, and then drive a little further and do it again. Mary shrugged. I suppose. Clara was done. She'd heard enough for the night. I'm really sleepy. I think I'll go on to bed. She stood up and went to the shelf to put her handwork down. Albert stood as well, putting his knife and wood on the top shelf as he did every night so there was no danger of Robert trying to play with it. I'll join you. He looked at Mary. Good night. We have breakfast at 5.30. He didn't wait for her reply, and instead followed Clara into the bedroom, closing the door behind him. As he undressed, he said, I'm so sorry she's being so difficult. I hope she leaves soon. I just can't kick her out, though. She's too much like Sally. Clara nodded. I do understand. I'll do my best to be pleasant to her. He sighed. She's not the most pleasant person in the world. I've dealt with worse. She quickly undressed and reached for her nightgown. His hand stopped her. I don't think you'll need that tonight, he whispered against her ear. She laughed softly. You don't? No, I really don't. He pulled her into his arms to demonstrate how she'd stay warm without it. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Clara fixed breakfast by herself and had the table set before anyone came down the stairs. Mary wasn't up. Clara sighed. It's time for breakfast. Natalie, would you run upstairs and wake Aunt Mary? Natalie nodded. Why didn't she get up and help with breakfast, Mama? If she's going to live here, she needs to do chores. Just wake her, Natalie. Clara wasn't up to explaining how some people didn't care enough to help others, but she'd have a long discussion with her daughter about it soon. Albert and Clarence came in from milking the cows and collecting eggs. They stomped the snow off their feet. Albert leaned down to kiss her good morning. You have snow on your eyelashes, she told him. He laughed. I guess I do. It's cold out there. He looked around the room. Where's Mary? I just sent Natalie to wake her. Albert let out a loud sigh. You're going to have to ask her to do specific chores. He shook his head. I don't think she's going to do anything around the house otherwise. Clara nodded. I can see that. I don't even ask the girls to do their chores. They know to just get up and do them. I know. They're both good girls. He and Clarence washed their hands for supper, and they all took their places. They didn't bother to wait for Mary, who still hadn't come down. As soon as Natalie was back, they ate. Mary still wasn't down when Albert and Clarence left for the day. We'll be here at noon. Clara nodded. They came home for lunch most days, but occasionally Albert asked her to pack a lunch pail for them. Lunch will be ready. The dishes were done and the girls had finished two subjects of schoolwork while Albert practiced writing his letters before Mary came down. She looked around. When is breakfast? Clara looked up from rolling out a pie crust. About two hours ago. We'll have lunch in another four hours or so. She said nothing else as she continued to roll out the crust. Mary glared at her. What about my breakfast? Clara shrugged. You're welcome to make yourself something and do the dishes when you're done if you'd like. Otherwise, you need to wait until lunchtime. I'll fix my own breakfast, but I won't do the dishes. That's what the girls are for. She pointed to the two girls who were sitting at the table, silently watching the exchange. 
The girls do dishes three times per day. They've already done the breakfast dishes. If you cook for yourself, you'll need to clean it up. Why didn't you save me a plate? Mary demanded. Albert told you breakfast was at 5.30. He told me not to do any extra work for you. Clara put the crust into a pie plate and carefully trimmed the edges. She then took a jar of apple pie filling she'd put up in September and opened it pouring it into the crust and quickly putting the top on, fluting the edges expertly. She put the pie on top of the stove to be baked later. She had on a pot of beans for lunch, and she'd make cornbread to go with them. Supper She had to figure something out for supper. She completely ignored her guest while she worked to get all the meals for the day in line for her family. Are you really not going to cook for me? Mary asked. Clara looked at her for a moment. I'll cook for you when I cook for the rest of the family. If you want to eat food I've cooked, then be here for meals. She went down into the cellar to see what they had for supper. A pot pie sounded good, and she knew that Albert loved them. She grabbed the vegetables she'd need along with some of the salt pork. She got to the main room in time to see Mary slamming her pots around. What are you going to make? she asked. I guess I'll make some eggs and bacon. She glared at Clara. Where's the bacon? Clara smiled. It's in the cellar. It stays colder down there and keeps longer. She pointed to the lantern she'd just used. You're welcome to go get some. Mary shook her head. You can't ask me to go down there. Albert will be furious when I tell him. Albert won't mind a bit. Clara carefully peeled the potatoes and carrots she'd brought up. Mary turned to the girls. Which one of you girls wants to go fetch me some bacon? Natalie looked at the back of Clara's head for a moment. I'll do it if my mama tells me to. Clara grinned at the words. Obviously Natalie realized Mary was playing games and wasn't going to give in to her. Gertie followed her older sister's lead, knowing she understood more about what was happening than she did. I'm not going to do it unless Mama says. Both girls continued to do their schoolwork. She didn't try to get Robert to go. Instead, she stormed back up the stairs, leaving the pots strewn all over the kitchen. Clara sighed. She'd have to get that taken care of quickly before Albert came back. She got everything chopped for their dinner and then put the beans she had soaking on to boil. She took the bacon she'd brought up earlier and cut it into pieces and dropped it in with the beans. She was finished with the lunch preparations by the time Mary came back downstairs. What are you making for lunch? Clara indicated the pot. Beans with bacon and cornbread. When will it be done? At noon. Clara moved to the sink and washed the few things she dirted. She preferred not to leave everything for the girls to do after meals. Sitting down at the table, she asked, How are your studies going this morning? Do either of you have any questions? Mary knew she'd been dismissed again and got even angrier. I need you to fix me a bath and take it up to my room for me. Clara looked at her. The tub is leaning against the side of the house and the stove is hot. You may use any pots you like. Mary stood over her, looking down at her. You really aren't going to ready a bath for me? Albert told me that I'm not allowed to let you cause me extra work. I wasn't planning on carrying any water up the stairs today, so that definitely qualifies as extra work. Clara stood up and walked over to the window. It's starting to snow harder. I hope Albert and Clarence make it back all right. Mary stood there trying to figure out if the other woman was really not going to help her. I need a bath. Clara nodded. You probably do after your travels. You're welcome to take one or take a spit bath if you prefer. I'm not carrying water for you, though. You may be able to talk Albert into it this evening, but I doubt it. She shrugged to indicate she really didn't care whether the other woman got a bath or didn't. 
You know that you're the new person here, not me. Albert loved me when we were young, and I'm sure it won't take him long to realize he loves me now. Clara shook her head. Really? It doesn't matter who he loves. He's married to me. She turned and walked toward her bedroom, unwilling to let the children see how angry she was at the other women. She stopped before she reached the door. She couldn't leave Robert and the girls with Mary. The woman seemed unstable. Instead, she got her mending basket down and started darning the stockings in it. Mary sat down across from her. She'd obviously given up on the ideas of bathing and eating. What are you doing? Clara raised an eyebrow. I'm mending socks. Had the woman never seen anyone work before? Why not just buy new ones? Is Albert poor? Clara blinked. Out here it's not that simple. We make the most of everything we have. I would have thought it was the same in Texas. Mary shrugged. It was for most. I was a merchant's daughter. If I had a hole in my stocking, I got a new one. Well, I mend ours. I like to get the most for my money. Just because I have money today, doesn't mean I'll have it tomorrow. Anything could go wrong, so the smart thing to do is to always be frugal. You really believe that? Clara nodded. I do. You're welcome to help me if you'd like. I have plenty of stockings that need to be mended. Mary shook her head. I don't do that type of work. Clara studied the other woman carefully. What type of work do you do? I can cook when I feel like it. I had servants to do everything else. Servants? Really? Why don't you have servants now? Mary flushed. My husband wasn't good with money. There was nothing left when he died. Which is why I'm frugal with my money. She continued darning the sock. You should find something to do. Being idle will make you crazy. Albert and Clarence stomped into the house. Clara looked at them. Is everything okay? That storm is getting bad. Albert shook his head. It is bad. We got the cattle enough hay that they'll survive if the blizzard doesn't last too long. It's going to be a bad one, though. He stomped off his boots and hung his coat and hat while Clarence did the same. Mary went to Albert. Clara is being extremely unkind to me. Albert's eyes met Clara's. How is she being unkind? She won't let me eat. Clara bit her lip to keep from yelling at the other woman about her untruth. She knew both girls had listened to every word, though, so she wasn't going to argue. Is that so? Albert asked. It is. I told her I was hungry too. Albert shrugged. I'm sure you're welcome to make yourself something to eat or to wait for lunch. I know my wife won't withhold food from you for long. She won't even get me what I need to cook for myself or ask either girl to do it, and they won't help me unless she tells them to. Albert looked at the girls, who were both watching with wide eyes, to see if they'd be punished. He smiled at them. Good girls. His eyes met Mary's. If you're that hungry, I suggest you get your own food and cook it. Or just have some of the bread Clara made yesterday with butter on it. That wouldn't kill you. He thought of all the jam sandwiches he'd eaten with his children after Sally died. He thanked God for the hundredth time he had never married the worthless woman. Mary sighed. So you support her not fixing a meal for me? Or even getting me the ingredients I need? I support my wife. No other words need to be spoken. I want you to take me to town. Albert laughed. I can't even work on the range in this storm. There's no way I'm driving to town and risking both of our necks. I want to go now. Mary's voice was just short of a yell. Albert sighed. Be my guest. Town is about eleven miles from here. You can walk that in a day or two. 
You'll be dead before you get there with this weather, but you're welcome to go. He walked to where Clara was sitting at the table with her sewing. He pulled out the chair and sat across from her. I'm done working at least for today and probably for tomorrow as well. Anything broken around the house that I need to take a look at? Clara smiled at him. Since the last storm, she'd been working on a list of things for him to do when the next blizzard hit. She hadn't thought of it the first time, and he'd made her crazy with his constant pacing and wanting to go out and work. He couldn't stand his hands being idle and made himself crazy when he couldn't work. She jumped up and went into their bedroom to get the list for him. He took one glance at it and burst out laughing. You really need all this done? Or are you just trying to find busy work for me? All of it needs to be done. She smiled sweetly. Today, if possible. He shook his head. Some of the things on the list were silly and some were useful. She'd actually put, read a book to Robert on the list. Yes, it was something he rarely did, and something he should do more often, but something he needed to do that day? I'll get to it. How long until lunch? It'll be ready around noon. You have some time. He stood up and walked toward the stairs. I'll start on moving the dressers in the kids' rooms so you can sweep behind them. Will you be ready to sweep when I get everything moved? I can be ready whenever you are, she called. He stopped and turned around, going to get the broom to carry up the stairs with him. She watched him go, smiling happily. She was going to keep him busy during this storm if it killed her. Clara turned to Clarence. Get started on your schoolwork. You should be able to do a week's worth every day you're off. Then you can have some free time in the evenings. Clarence nodded, going to the shelf to get his books. Yes, ma'am. Robert had followed Albert up the stairs. Clara noticed that any time Mary was around he wanted to be close enough to touch either her or Albert. She'd always considered children the best judges of character. What did Robert know that she didn't? Mary sat at the table with her and watched her work. I'm bored. There's nothing to do here. Clara nodded. When the children tell me they're bored, I find them some chores to do. Would you like some chores, Mary? Mary sighed. No, I don't want any chores. She watched everything Clara did. Why did you give Albert a list of things to do? You shouldn't be ordering him around. Because he gets restless during storms. Staying busy is good for him. Natalie stood then, stretching. I finished my schoolwork, Mama. Is there anything I can do to help you? Natalie wasn't usually the kind to offer to help, but she always did the chores she was given. Clara had a feeling that Natalie was tired of the way Mary was treating her and trying to show her how to be helpful and do chores. I'd love it if you went upstairs and swept after the furniture is moved. She smiled at her daughter. Thank you, Natalie. I'm happy to help you, Mama. You do a lot for me. Natalie kissed Clara's cheek on her way to the stairs. Clara watched her go with a smile. Moving had been very good for Natalie. She was a lot more focused on the things she needed to do now that she spent all her time at home with her family. Mary snorted. Did you talk to them all at breakfast and tell them to be perfect around me? Clara shook her head. I didn't. She never once looked up and kept to the task at hand. When Gertie finished her schoolwork, she jumped up. I'm going to go help too. She ran up the stairs to join Albert, Robert, and Natalie. Clara stood to mix the cornbread and get lunch finished. She shivered a bit as she looked at the snow blowing outside the window. She was glad the house was as sturdy as it was, and she could feel no drafts. She looked over her shoulder at Mary, who was still sitting at the table doing nothing. Do you want to mix up the cornbread? You said you don't mind cooking. Mary glared at her. With the way I've been treated today? You really think that I'm going to help you cook? 
Clara shrugged and put the ingredients into the bowl, mixing them against her stomach. She'd get it done in no time. She and the girls did a good job in the house, and she didn't care if Mary helped or not. Clara slid the cornbread into the oven and stirred the beans. She'd made more than usual, because with Mary there, and having not eaten breakfast, she was sure they'd run out. By the time lunch was ready, she'd set the table and the rest of the family was back downstairs. Just about ready, she told Albert when he came down, Robert still, clinging to his leg. While they ate, Albert laughed about how dusty it was under the furniture. You really did need that job done. I thought you were just having me do busy work, so I wouldn't be in your way. Clara laughed softly. There was a little of that mixed in, but those are jobs that are difficult for me to do, so while you're not working, I'd appreciate the help. Mary wouldn't look at anyone throughout the meal, she just methodically shoveled food into her mouth. Finally, when she was finished, she leaned back in her chair. I need you to take me to town as soon as the weather is clear enough. Albert shrugged. I'll do it if I can. The first day or two after a blizzard are busy with seeing to the cattle and making sure they're all right. So your cattle are more important than I am? Mary asked indignantly. Albert laughed. My cattle are my livelihood. From what my girls tell me, you won't even raise a finger to bathe yourself. Why would I worry about you? Clara hid her grin. She loved that Albert was defending her. She loved it even more that the girls had made sure he knew how the other woman was treating her. Clara was nothing but kind, but she wouldn't go out of her way to do what the other woman wanted her to do. After lunch, the girls jumped up to wash the dishes immediately. They'd always been good about doing their chores, but that day they were exceptional. She knew it was because of how Mary was treating her, and she couldn't help but smile at them as they worked. Clarence settled in at the table to do some more schoolwork, while Albert went to the barn to get some tools he needed to complete one of the jobs she'd asked of him. Skip that one if it means going outside in this, Clara suggested. I'll be fine. This isn't my first blizzard. Albert leaned down to press a quick kiss to her lips, making her realize that he really did care for her, if he'd kiss her so openly in front of the other woman. Clara returned to her sewing, ignoring the other woman and her sullen look. She just didn't care to pay attention to her when she was being so rude to her. Mary watched everything she did that day, as if she were trying to find something to complain about, but there was nothing. Clara worked from the time she got up in the morning until she went to bed, and she wasn't going to worry about what the other woman thought about her. The snow had stopped the following morning, and Albert was thrilled. That was a short one. We may not have lost any cattle at all. He practically skipped out of the house, with Clarence behind him. Mary again wasn't up in time for breakfast, and Clara didn't put a portion aside for her. She wasn't going to do anything like that for someone who wasn't helping out at all. That evening during dinner, Albert told Mary he'd take her to town the following morning. Where are you planning to go? he asked politely. Mary shrugged. I have nowhere to go, but I can't stay here with people who mistreat me. How have you been mistreated exactly? he asked. Mary glared at him. I've already told you. No one will get a bath ready for me. No one will fix me a meal. You're eating a meal now, Albert pointed out logically. Yes, I am, but no one saved any breakfast for me. And no one will hear. If you want to go to town, you need to be ready right after breakfast in the morning. I have some friends I'll introduce you to if you'd like. He didn't add that he was hoping they could make each other miserable. She nodded regally. Maybe one of them can use a wife or a lady's companion. He laughed. No one here needs a lady's companion. Men want wives though, and there just aren't enough women. He shrugged. I'm sure even you can find a husband. Just make sure they don't see your personality until after they've said, I do. I can't believe you just said that to me. 
I can't believe no one said it before. Albert stood up and walked to the door, shrugging into his coat. I'm going to go make sure the horses will be warm enough through the night. Mary watched him go with venom in her eyes. She looked at Clara. I notice he didn't invite you to go with us. Clara shrugged. He'll probably take Clarence as well. The girls worked on the dishes while Clara got her sewing. She wasn't going to listen to anything else the venomous woman had to say to her. Chapter 7 The following morning was tense. Clara had one of the girls wake Mary well before breakfast to be sure she was ready to go on time. Clara didn't want to spend another minute with the other woman under her roof. As soon as breakfast was over, Albert sent Mary up the stairs to get her things. We need to leave in 15 minutes. Be ready. Clara watched her go, happy that she was finally going to be out of her house. It seemed as if she'd been there for years, even though it had only been a few days. Clara couldn't help but wonder how much like her sister Sally had been. She'd probably ask him once Mary was gone, but she hadn't been willing to broach the subject with her there. Clarence helped hitch up the team and ran back into the house to be sure Clara knew he was going with Albert. Clara fixed a lunch for them and smiled as she waved them off. The back of another woman's head had never looked quite so good to Clara. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Albert made sure Clarence sat in the front seat of the sleigh between him and Mary. He should sit in the back. He's making it crowded up here, and he's just a child, Mary protested. Albert shrugged. I don't want him to get cold in the back. He's sharing our body heat this way. What do you care? He's not even your son. He's just the son of that terrible woman you married. She shook her head. I can't believe you married her anyway. I'm sure you'd have waited for me if you'd known I was coming, but couldn't you have found someone better? It's almost insulting. Albert looked at her with surprise. You think I would have waited for you instead of marrying Clara? What have I done to make you think that? Mary laughed. Don't deny it, Albert. You loved me. That's true. Loved. Past tense. I stopped loving you the day you told me you couldn't wait for me. It didn't take me long to realize that Sally was the one I'd loved all along. Sally was everything you weren't. She was a hard worker, sweet and loving. You, you're poison to everyone you see or touch. I'm so glad to get you out of my house. Albert drove staring at the road ahead of him, wondering what Clarence thought of the conversation he was having with Mary. My new wife is a better wife than you could ever dream of being. She puts the children and me before herself in everything. I've never met such an unselfish woman in my life. Mary looked at him and gasped as if offended. Are you calling me selfish, Albert Hansen? Well, I didn't say it in so many words, but you are one of the most selfish people I've ever met. You think of no one but yourself. You came here without giving me notice to try and take over my life. I didn't want you here, Mary. Even if Clara hadn't been here, I'd have wanted to toss you out on your ear. Mary sputtered for a moment, staring at him over Clarence's head. Clara doesn't hold a candle to me or my sister. Albert laughed aloud. Have you ever heard the expression, pretty is as pretty does? Clara was attractive to me when she arrived because she has a pretty face. Now? She's the most beautiful woman I've ever met, because she has a good attitude about everything she does. She told me not to buy her anything for Christmas, but she stays up late every night making special gifts for the children. I don't know what she's done for me, but I'm sure she's done something that will be wonderful, because it's who she is. He shook his head. I almost feel sorry for you. You expect every man in the world to fall at your feet because you have a pretty face. It's not going to happen because you don't have the personality and work ethic to back up that pretty face. How dare you? It all needed to be said. Do you have money for a train ticket to Texas? 
Albert asked. Of course, I don't. If I had money, I wouldn't have shown up on your doorstep, now would I? I'll buy your ticket. To where? Mary asked shrilly. I have nowhere to go. No one wants me. Mama and Papa are dead. Albert shrugged. Where am I taking you then? If not to the train station? I don't know. I just had to get away from that woman you married. He sighed. Maybe there will be someone in town who will hire you to do something. Are you now implying that I'm not good for anything? He shrugged. I'll let you make that decision. He stopped because they'd reached the mercantile. Maybe someone will be advertising for something you can do. He jumped down and waited for Clarence, but left her to get down on her own. He didn't like how she'd talked about his wife. The woman was a real pain in his behind, and he wasn't going to mess with her any longer. He walked into the mercantile and called to Samuel. Anyone looking for a woman to do some work for them? Samuel shook his head, slowly. No one that I know of. I know a few of the men around town are thinking about sending off for mail-order brides, though. You got someone you're trying to get rid of? Albert grinned. My first wife's sister needs somewhere to go. She's unhappy at my house, and she has nowhere else. Any suggestions? Samuel took a piece of paper and calmly made a list which he then handed to Albert. There's a list of men that I know are looking for brides. Go talk to them. Maybe one of them will take her off your hands. Albert let out a low laugh. That's what I'm looking for. He glanced down at the list. No one closer to town? I want to dump her and go back home. He sighed. It's going to be a long day. Clarence looked at him. Pa, why does Aunt Mary hate Mama so much? Albert shook his head. There are just some people in this world who have no love inside them. I think Mary is one of those. He strode toward the wagon with Clarence trailing behind him. Mary was still sitting on the seat of the sleigh. I see you finally remembered me. Albert shrugged. We're ready to go on. There are no jobs for women in town, but there are several men around looking for a wife. We'll go visit them and see which one will take you. Take me? You make me sound like a terrible burden you can't wait to be rid of. Albert, how can you treat me this way? He ignored her question as he tipped his hat at a friend as they drove south out of town. There had to be someone who wanted sex so badly, he'd marry a shrew like Mary, didn't there? It was an hour before they arrived at the first man's house. Albert jumped down, telling Clarence to stay put. He wandered around for a moment, hoping he could find the man, and he wouldn't be out on the range. Finally, he spotted his friend, Eli King, coming out of the barn. He raised his hand in greeting. Eli walked toward him eyeing the sleigh. He held his hand out for the other man to shake. Good to see you, Albert. You doing all right? I have a slight dilemma. I sent off for a mail-order bride a few months back, and she's here and the best wife I could have asked for. A few days ago, my late wife's sister showed up, widowed, thinking she could keep house for me. She spent her last dime on train travel. Albert shrugged. I don't really know what to do with my former sister-in-law, but she'd like to marry again. You in the market for a wife or a housekeeper? Eli looked at the sleigh and saw the pretty woman sitting in the front. What's wrong with her? Albert laughed loudly. What makes you think there's something wrong with her? I know you, and I know you'd keep her if there was any way it was possible. Why can't she stay at your house? Albert sighed. Because she's mean and lazy and is doing her best to make my wife's life difficult. Eli shook his head. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm sure someone will take her, but I don't need no crazy woman in my life. She's not crazy. Sounds crazy to me. Thanks for thinking of me. 
If you get a good woman in, look me up. Albert grinned. I'm kind of glad you said no, but I felt the need to ask you first. Some men are willing to put up with anything for regular sex. I'm not one of them. Bring me back a good one. I don't get women in every day. Albert walked back toward the sleigh with Eli beside him. He introduced his friend to Clarence and Mary. This is my former sister-in-law, Mary, and my new son, Clarence. Clarence is more help around the ranch than I ever imagined an eight-year-old would be. Nice to meet you, ma'am, Clarence. Eli tipped his hat politely. He turned to Albert, and they clasped gloved hands together. I'd love to meet your new wife. Invite me over for a good home-cooked meal sometime, will ya? Clarence smiled. My mom is the best cook around. Albert nodded. She is. Why don't you come over for Christmas dinner? We'll eat around two so you can get home before dark. I'd love to introduce you. Eli grinned. I can't wait to meet the woman that put the sparkle back in your eye. Albert climbed back into the sleigh, and the three of them drove off. He looked at his list and headed to the man who was closest. Hopefully he'd be more interested in Mary than Eli had been. Where exactly are we going, Albert? Mary asked finally. Albert looked at her. I'm trying to find you a place to stay. Either a man who needs a wife or a housekeeper. She looked over her shoulder. Why not him? Albert shrugged. He didn't want you. Mary stared at him in shock. What do you mean he didn't want me? He said he doesn't have the patience to put up with a woman like you. Albert shrugged. He didn't see me before he said that, though. Albert laughed. He saw you just fine. He just doesn't want a woman who won't work and put him first. There's a man that will. We just have to find him. It was almost supper time when they finally found a man who would take her. Albert had begun to worry he'd never find anyone. He'd been through over half of his list at that point. He pulled up in front of Frank Rivers' house and jumped down, thankful he wouldn't need to hunt this man down, because he should be home for supper. Frank wasn't a particular friend of his, so he didn't mind if he decided to take Mary on, but he wouldn't lie to him either. He went to the door and knocked while the other two sat in the cold sleigh. If Frank didn't want her, he'd have to drive home and try again in a couple of days. He needed to get some work done before he could lose another full day. Frank came to the door and looked at him oddly. Hello, Albert. How can I help you? Albert smiled. This was one of the men who had been in the mercantile and had made rude comments about him taking a new wife. My first wife's twin sister came to town. Her husband died, and she thought she could keep house for me. I didn't need a housekeeper, because I have a wife, so I'm looking to see if someone around here could use a wife or housekeeper. Frank's eyes widened. Your first wife was a beauty. I'll look at her for sure. He looked at Albert suspiciously. You don't want to keep her for a bit? Have her help your wife with chores? Albert shook his head. My house is too full as it is. I know you're looking for a wife, so I thought you might be interested. Can she cook? Albert shrugged. She hasn't cooked for me in a good fifteen years. Why don't you ask her to come in and cook something for you? See how it goes? He hoped he and Clarence could get a meal out of it as well. It was supper time and they'd had to share their lunch meant for two among three people. That's a good idea. Get her in here. Frank watched as Albert went to the sleigh and invited Clarence and Mary to come in. Frank's eyes widened as he saw the woman in question. When she was close, he smiled his biggest smile, showing off the wide gap between his front teeth. Can you cook? Mary nodded emphatically. I'm a wonderful cook. Albert said nothing as the man invited the three of them inside. 
He took the seat that was indicated and sat beside Clarence at the table while Frank crossed his arms over his chest. Cook then. Cook for all four of us, and if I like what I taste, then I'll consider marrying you. Mary gasped with surprise. You're making me audition to marry you? Frank shrugged. Looks like you don't have much of a choice, now do you? Cook, and I'll see if I want you around. Mary spun away from him, tears pricking her eyes. She rummaged for some food and came up with almost nothing. How do you expect me to cook when you don't have any food? Frank waved to the trap door in the floor. There's food down there. Fetch it and cook. He took a seat beside Albert and waited for the woman to do as he'd told her. Mary huffed as she grabbed a lantern, opened the trap door, and went down into the cellar. She came back up the stairs with her arms full of potatoes, bacon, and a basket of eggs. Not one of the men moved to help her, and she glared at them. She hurried to the stove, using a bit of lard to melt in the frying pan, while she peeled the potatoes and cut them up. She fried the bacon and potatoes and then added eggs. Within minutes, she had a good meal cooked, and the four of them gobbled it down. When he had wiped his mouth with his sleeve, Frank said, Yeah, she'll do. I'll keep her, Albert. Mary glared at him. Don't you think you should ask me first? Frank shrugged. I don't guess so. Albert doesn't want you, and from what I can tell, no one else does either. Mary looked at Albert. Are you going to make me stay here and marry this man? I don't know what you want me to do, Mary. There are no jobs available in town. You don't want me to put you on a train somewhere. You won't help my wife around the house. You either stay here and marry him or figure something else out. I'm done. Albert looked at Frank. You mind if Clarence and I spend the night here? I don't think we can make it home safely this late at night with the snow. Frank nodded. That's fine. I've got a couple of spare rooms. No sheets on the beds, but Mary can take care of that after the dishes are done. You expect me to do the dishes? I just cooked dinner. Frank laughed. I expect you to cook and do dishes three times a day and keep the house clean. If kids come along, they'll be your responsibility too. Get on it, woman. Mary reluctantly walked to the basin and washed the dishes, grumbling all the while. When she was finished, she made both of the beds. Where do I sleep tonight? she asked, her voice sharp with anger. In one of the spare rooms. I'll have you all to myself tomorrow night. He leered at her, and she ran from the room choosing one of the rooms and slamming the door hard. Albert looked at Frank. You're not going to mistreat her, are you? Frank shook his head. Course not. She just needs to know I'm boss from the beginning. Kinda like when you're training a horse. Albert chuckled. You two are going to have an interesting life together. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Clara didn't expect them back for lunch. But when it was almost supper time and the two were still out, she became worried. She served supper, but kept glancing out the window every few minutes to see if they were home. She put two huge portions of dinner in the oven and watched as the girls did the dishes. When it was time to put the children to bed, she was almost shaking with fear, but did her best to not let the girls know it. Mama, where are they? Do you think something happened? Natalie asked. I'm sure everything is fine. They probably realized it was too dark to come home, so they stayed in town. Natalie eyed her skeptically, but didn't argue. She got into bed without another word and waited while Clara kissed first Gertie and then her. Good night, Mama. Clara turned at the door and smiled at both the girls. Good night. Sleep sweet. She closed the door behind her, hurrying down the stairs to continue her vigil. What would she do if something happened to them? She couldn't run a ranch by herself. She sat in her chair at the table and knitted, 
knowing she had to do something to take her mind off things. Finally, when it was well past midnight, she went to her bed. She lay awake in the darkness, with tears streaming down her face. She couldn't imagine what life would be like without either of them. Albert, how had she come to love the man? She'd promised herself she wouldn't love anyone the way she'd loved Nathan, and yet, here she was. Lying in the dark, crying over him. She slept for less than an hour and woke early, her stomach more than a little upset. She wasn't sure if it was from lack of sleep or from worrying about her men, but she knew something was making her sick. She fixed breakfast, automatically making the same amount she made for all six of them and laughing at herself. She forced herself to eat a small amount of dry toast, but she vomited it almost immediately. Both of the girls knew how worried she was and watched her carefully. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Albert woke later than usual, the next morning in the room he was sharing with Clarence. He could hear pans being banged around in the kitchen and assumed Frank had told Mary to get out of bed and feed them all. He smiled. He'd solved his and Clara's problem, but it looked like Frank was going to be able to handle Mary after all. He went down to breakfast and ate the pancakes Mary had made. She hadn't exaggerated. She was a good cook. She wasn't Clara, but she was almost as good. He put his hat on after breakfast. Clarence, it's time for us to get home. Your ma must be worried sick. Mary hurried to the door. You can't leave me here. Can't you at least go to the wedding? I don't think I should stay here with a stranger that I'm not even married to. Albert let out a loud sigh before nodding reluctantly. He could see the problem with being alone with a man she barely knew. We'll follow the two of you into town. She shook her head. No, I want to ride with you. We either follow you and Frank into town and stay for the wedding, or we go on home now. Either way would be just fine with me. He hoped she'd be angry with him and just tell him to go. Mary looked like she was about to cry. Follow us into town, then. My sister would not be happy with you, though. Albert laughed. Your sister knew you for who you were. She wouldn't care one lick. He waited until the couple was ready, and he and Clarence followed them into town. They witnessed the wedding, and Albert couldn't help but laugh when Mary stomped on Frank's foot after the ceremony. As soon as they were pronounced man and wife, Albert shook hands with Frank. I hope you two are happy together. Frank shrugged. We will be. Albert led Clarence to the sleigh, and they turned toward home finally. He looked at his pocket watch. It was going to be afternoon before they got back. Poor Clara would be worried sick. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. As the day progressed, Clara did her best to keep to her normal schedule. She baked bread as soon as the dishes were done and did the laundry, including all the linens, hanging it in the basement. She even stripped the curtains off the windows and washed them so she wouldn't have to think about anything. The physical labor kept her mind off her worries. As she was cleaning off the table after lunch, she heard the horses and rushed to the window. She sighed with relief. There they were. She threw the door open and rushed outside into the cold. She wore no shoes or coat, but she didn't care. She needed to know her family was fine. Everything all right, she called. Albert nodded. I need to see to the horses, but then I'll be right in. Clara went back into the house and pulled the remains of lunch from the oven, setting the table for the two of them. She was so relieved they were all right she had tears rolling down her face. She'd never take anyone for granted again. When they came back into the house, Clara didn't wait for Albert to remove his coat and instead threw herself at him, hugging him tightly. I was so worried. Albert wrapped his arms around her, holding her close. I'm sorry. Mary was difficult. She didn't want to go anywhere and demanded I find her a place to live in town. 
I didn't feel right about sending her back to Texas with no family there, so I took her to some of the ranches around town, trying to find her a job as a housekeeper or find someone stupid enough to take her as a bride. Clara nodded. I should have guessed it was something like that. Albert rubbed the back of his neck, shrugging out of his coat. He walked to the basin and washed his hands, before taking a seat at the table. He continued his story, while she served lunch to both him and Clarence. It was late before I finally found someone who would take her as a bride, and I didn't think it would be safe to travel home. So I stayed the night with Frank, my friend who married her this morning, and thought to come home first thing this morning. Of course, then she decided that she couldn't be alone with the man until they were legally married, so we followed them back into town and stayed for the wedding. He shook his head. I should have just dumped her in town, but she looked so much like Sally, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Clara sat down across from him and took his hand. I'm just glad you're okay. You're not angry that we worried you? His eyes searched hers carefully for any sign of anger. She shrugged. You're not dead, so I'm elated. I might get mad later. He laughed softly. You look like you barely slept. I only got about an hour. I couldn't stop worrying about you. She looked around. I got a lot of cleaning done while I worried, though. He squeezed the hand she held. House looks great. His eyes searched hers. Thank you for caring enough to worry about me. She sighed. How could I do anything else? While he ate, he told her about Frank and how he demanded that Mary fix him a good meal before he'd agree to marry her. Clara bit her lip to keep from laughing, but after a moment, she couldn't keep it in any longer. She burst out laughing, holding her side. It didn't take long for Albert to join her. She had tears rolling down her face. It sounds like he's the perfect husband for her. Albert wiped a tear from his own eye, grinning at her. He is the perfect husband for her. He's going to keep her hopping. He finished his meal and pulled Clara into a tight hug. Thank you for not being angry when I took her to town without you. You were really good about her being here, even though I know she had to be making you absolutely crazy. Clara smiled, hugging him close. I'm glad she's gone. I'll say that now. He grinned. We're all glad she's gone.